In this video, we're gonna be covering five tips for brand new nonprofits to get started on the right foot. Let's get going. We are Ted and Lisa Snyder, we're nonprofit consultants, and we do that because we believe that better world needs healthier nonprofits. This is hugely important, and a huge part for nonprofits is the getting started process. Uh, whether you are, you know, you already have your paperwork done, you have all everything lined up, and you're like, we are ready to go, uh, or you're kind of in that process, there are a few tips that a lot of times nonprofits just don't know about. And too often we see nonprofits that have their idea, have gotten their paperwork, are getting started, and they sit there on day one and they realize we we don't know what to do. Or <laughs> we wrote this, but we're not sure what it means. And there's just so much going on. And we've learned that there are a few things that if you can get it right from day one, it makes a lot of the future things that you want to do to make this world a better place a whole lot easier. So watch to the end. The last one is hugely important. Well, they all are important, but <laughs> definitely keep an eye out for tip number five. So getting started, keep your vision statement short, clear, and at a fourth grade reading level. We have been saying this for years and it's so incredibly yes. important. One time we were on a road trip, we were driving around and we saw a truck that was representing a local nonprofit. I won't point them out too much because I don't want them <laughs> to feel bad, but representing a local nonprofit. Um, and the, they had their vision statement on the side of this truck. And it was like, uh, it wasn't a semi truck, but it was like a delivery van sized tr truck. Maybe it was a delivery van, but either way, it was a pretty big truck. And the vision statement took up the entirety of the space of this truck. And like and not big fonts, like it wasn't, <laughs> you know, five words. It was it, like, a, it was a paragraph, was a paragraph. And it was like, we support this in this community and partner with these things to promote blank and whatever health in the in the nation or whatever. And I was like, and it was big words too. They were like you big guys, words that were like college age. I level. was getting like college flashbacks of <laughs> sitting in class confused at what was happening. Like that's what was happening. We're reading it going. I don't understand what they're saying. I don't know what they do. And my head hurts. And I graduated a long time ago. We don't need this right now. We're on vacation. <laughs> but it's so important that your vision statement for your nonprofit is clear, short. And the reason we say at a fourth grade reading level is so that you are communicating in a way that anyone can really understand. When organizations start to use really big words that are very much um, scientific or psychological or um, very niche to their organization and to their kind of sphere where they work, it's incredibly hard for the average person to say, I get it, I care about it, and I'm going to help with it. Because for us, we spent so much time trying to get it that we never got to the place where we cared about it. Uh, mm -hmm. We were driving next to the truck for a while. We read the whole thing. We started to, to, to discuss it. It took a turn. We went straight. I have no idea. I never got to the point where I was like, oh, here's how they help people, though. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, some of the other benefits of keeping it easy to read and short and clear, your next biggest donor might not have English be their first language. Mm -hmm. Like, be thinking on a bigger scale than... I want to make sure we communicate every single thing we do. Right. Don't try to do that in your vision statement. Yeah. Vision statement is about why you're doing what you do, not what you're doing necessarily. Or even how you're doing it. Uh, by short, we mean 21 words or less. If you can do it in 21 words or less, get the heart of what you're doing behind it. Someone who connects with what it is that you're doing will ask more questions to figure out how you're doing it and what you're doing. So short, clear, fourth grade reading level. Tip number two transparency is king in the nonprofit yes. world the whole point of nonprofit and what you know even what the requirements make you do the idea is to be transparent you have people need to be able to see into your organization see what's going on be able to track where the money's going what the leadership is like all that stuff because they are making trust based decisions to yep. give you money to give you time to tell their friends about what you're doing in the world and to trust that it's actually happening so every decision that you make needs to be one that is like transparency focused. Think about it. Your donors are not going to target buying an item, bringing it home, trying it out, and maybe they can return it if it's not a good fit. They are looking <laughs> at you going, I have money. And instead of choosing on something that I'm going to get an actual, like physical, tangible object for, 
I'm going to give it to you and cross my fingers and hope that I don't regret this decision. And there's no refund policy. You need to be transparent because people are looking out for the things that smell fishy. And <laughs> a lot of times, it's not that nonprofits are actually doing anything that is sketchy. Usually it's that nonprofits either don't know how to tell the stories, don't know how to give the numbers, and aren't trying to be transparent. And so people assume, well, if you don't care about transparency, you must have a reason for it and you must be hiding something. Right. And so making transparency a big focus of what you're doing, especially as you're starting out as a new mm -hmm. nonprofit, get in the habit of it now, letting people know, hey, if you want to see exactly where this money went, you can do this. If you want to know exactly, if you want to see pictures of the orphanage that we helped in the other place, here's where to find them. Like, you need to show proof, you need to show receipts, you need to show all that stuff to people who want to. And here's the here's the bonus of that. People who like to donate large amounts of money or give a lot of their time, they know how to vet organizations to be able to decide if it's a good investment. Yep. You know, if they have, you know, business owner that likes to make investments in nonprofits, guess what? They also know how to make good investments versus bad investments. They know how to buy things at a low price, add some value and sell it at a higher price, right? So they know how to do that with your organization. If you're not transparent, they're not going to be able to run the numbers. And if they can't run the numbers, they'll go find somewhere else where they can run the numbers. That's yep. just how it works. Tell stories, give the numbers. If you're a newer organization uh, and you don't have numbers yet for what your organization does, Talk about the numbers on for what your cause is going to help accomplish. So maybe it's last week we we're able to help this family with X, Y, and Z. In our community, there are this number of families going through this situation. Mm -hmm. um, have numbers in there somewhere, either about how you are helping or how many people you intend to help. Because that shows that you have done the research, that you understand what it is that you're trying to do, and that you have a plan for where you are going. Yeah, and this is tip number three, by the way. Tell stories and give numbers. They work together. The numbers show we have uh, of the ability to do more of this. And the stories that you tell, the individual stories of the impact that you're making says, this is what you're giving to. So you tell a story about how you influenced the community in some way, and you share it, and you connect with people's heart. And then you say, hey, we did that 337 times last year. With yeah. your donation, we could do it an extra 50 times, you know, yeah. and then people are connecting saying like, wow, that one story was so powerful. If I could even help to do two more of those, I would totally do it. I'll, fi I'll figure if I got some loose change in my pockets, I'll figure out how to help in some way. And this is a big deal. Uh, we actually pulled this from our nonprofit from scratch course on t uh, Teachable because it's such a such a big deal to know how to tell stories and give numbers. When you're starting an organization, uh, yeah, the paperwork is a tricky thing and figuring out how to file and you know having to talk to the right people and getting board members, those are all really important to starting an organization. But knowing from the beginning how to tell stories and share the numbers yeah. is a huge boon to your organization. Yeah. Speaking of board members, tip number four, pick the right people, not just the people who can fog a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I have seen it advertised. We are looking for a board member and it can be anyone. And they'll list like 40 different, 40 different background options. You can have an education or no education or be a mom or a dad or not have kids or be a man or a woman or be a college student or like, or an entrepreneur, or you can work for a fortune 500 company, or you can work for McDonald's. Like the list is basically just anyone who can fog a mirror, you're welcome to join our board. Board. The board. <laughs> <laughs> right. But organizations do this for those important um, positions. They'll also do it for volunteer roles. Anyone can volunteer within, within our organization. We have space for everyone. We need a leader. Do you have 10 hours extra a week? Because if you do, we can make you a leader. You don't want to do that with your organization. Pick the right people for your board. You want people who are passionate, who care about what you care about, who are responsible, who are ethically above board, like way beyond. You want to make sure that there are people are looking out for you, for your organization, and that they want to see longevity for your organization. And 
who are kind of willing to help out because I have seen board members who are willing to show up to the meetings and won't lift a finger beyond that. You want some people who actively want to see this work. Yeah. On the other end of it, like volunteers, right? So board is kind of like top level C-suite type stuff down on the ground level, the volunteers, you want to pick the right people for the right positions. Yeah. Um, now, I'm a firm believer that you should try to create as many positions as you can to help uh, different people with different skill sets, uh, levels of passion, level of, of commitment, uh, levels of time. You want to create lots of different opportunities so that way you can fit the right people into the right spots. If somebody wants to be able to help your organization, you should have a way for them to do it. If, if, even if they don't have money, even if they don't have a ton of time, even if they don't have a lot of leadership potential, or uh, maybe they just don't have a lot of energy. Maybe they can only give like uh, an hour a week, but they're really, really great leaders, right? So you want to have positions available to be yeah. able to put the right people into the right places. And what's cool about that is that can lead into giving you the ability to to kind of like move people from one position to the next if something's not working out yep. or if they're showing like, wow, they, they've got potential to be, be a leader in this situation and possibly like they might be a future board member. Because you've put the right people in the right positions, it allows you to sort people Absolutely. and help and they kind of sort themselves into the areas of passion and in areas of expertise and uh, getting the right people into those positions is so key. Start doing it from day one. Don't wait. Oh, you know, when we're five years old as an organization, then we can really start to find the right people for the positions. Yeah. You got to start now and it's going to cost you, you know, not having some positions filled for a little bit, but it is so worth it. You don't want to be limping five years from now because you've got one wrong person in a board position who's who's throttling Ooh, yes. back <laughs> your organization, keeping it from being able to move forward. Yeah. That is... and. You know, some of those happen. some of those positions like board positions are sometimes they're hard to get rid of depending on your bylaws. Like you might yep. not be able to just like oust the person very easily. Absolutely. Um, our fifth tip for this is hugely important. And it's probably not the one that you want to hear, but it this will make or this is huge. I think <laughs> out of all the tips, this is the one that I'm like, this directly impacts the longevity of your organization over anything else. And that's get comfortable asking for donations. I have talked she, to... Oh, go I was ahead. just going to say, she's not saying go out and ask for donations. She's saying get, get comfortable, comfortable doing it. Get comfortable with it. Um, there are so many times that we talk to nonprofit leaders and there's this level of, well, I didn't get into this because I don't... I didn't, I didn't get into this to ask for money. I didn't get into this to do sales. I don't want to bring up money. It's an icky subject, whatever it might be. But... In order for your organization to last, it has to be financially viable in order to actually help the cause that you're trying to help. Money is a resource that your organization does need. And the more comfortable that you get about asking for those donations, the easier it's going to be to have those conversations. I'm not saying get better. Sometimes people think I have to get better first. I have to practice. I have to script. I have to figure all things out. No, it's really a matter of bringing it into normal conversations as you're meeting with different people and getting comfortable with the idea. Because if you are uncomfortable asking for donations, chances are you're also uncomfortable receiving donations. Ooh. And nothing turns off a donor quicker than giving a donation and having the person they gave it to be so awkward that they never want to have that interaction again. So if you can get comfortable <laughs> asking for donations, that's huge. Yeah. And one of the ways that we recommend getting comfortable asking for donations is, is like find a way to learn some sales tactics, pick up a couple sales books, start mm -hmm. to read through them. You don't have to be a nasty, disgusting car salesman from like the 1960s with a with a <laughs> with a comb over, you know, haircut and like a gross yellow shirt and a tie. You don't have to be a gross salesperson to ask for money. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so just understanding how sales works a little bit removes some of those barriers, makes yep. it a little less uncomfortable. And as you're more comfortable, you'll do it more. You'll naturally get better at it. And uh, if you want to know how to make better use of your opportunities to get donations, we actually have another video that we think that you will like and you can check it out. We're going to dive deeper in this video. Uh, seven tips to increase donations 
for your nonprofit. It's showing up somewhere on the screen over here. I encourage you to <laughs> click on that so you can increase your ability to get donations. And we'll see you guys in the next video.